I just wanted to start off by saying we're all here because we believe that the management of severe acute malnutrition is critical to child survival. And each of us feel that we have a role to play in making that a reality. In line with UNICEF's remit for child health and also as Global Nutrition Cluster lead, UNICEF has been heavily engaged in supporting the scale-up of community-based management of acute malnutrition. I'd like to highlight, however, UNICEF's role is a complementary one. And it's only as effective as it is to the degree in which it engages across the wide range of actors that are involved in making this a reality, meaning governance, governments, UN sister agencies, NGOs, civil society, as well as the academic donor and private sector communities. For that and many other reasons, I'm very pleased to be able to speak with you today a little bit and to share a few reflections for the, from the last 10 years and a few, highlighting a few areas to look at perhaps and consider for the next 10. One thing I'd like to share is the release of the 2012 SAM mapping. I think uh, you'll find it in your folders, hopefully. As of 2009, there was no strong, up-to-date, reliable global, regional and country level estimates around SAM programming in order to monitor quality and scale-up of programs to identify best practices and capacity gaps and to guide technical support and ensure our accountability for our inputs. UNICEF, in collaboration with VALID and, and partners, undertook a SAM mapping, a baseline, to say, where are we? We've invested in this. We need to know where we are so that we can make, take it forward. What we have here is from 2000 to 2012, the list, the number of countries that are actively engaged in programming to treat severe acute malnutrition. And we can see that there was a major scale up between 2005 to 2009, but that, that trend is continuing. Digging a little bit deeper beyond the numbers, there are a few other things that we can say. First of all, national nutrition information systems are variable in terms of strength, structure, and quality, which is a major limitation as we try to move the treatment of severe acute malnutrition forward. Some shortfalls include complex reporting systems, limited harmonization of templates, and no systematic collection of data on programs. This isn't necessarily in every country. I think we'll have discussions tomorrow with examples from different countries that we can learn from. But overall, we have some limitations in terms of our understanding and data collection. Another thing coming out is that SAM has been framed primarily as a humanitarian activity. In 2009, nearly half of the countries initiated a SAM treatment program in response to a, uh, an environmental or a political emergency. This still rings true today as the majority of, as we look internally in UNICEF figures, the majority of uh, funding that's put forth towards SAM treatment that goes through UNICEF is still humanitarian. At the same time, oops, um, at the same time, we have seen over the last 10 years an increasing shift and a move away from humanitarian NGO programming to using that, leveraging that, to integrating and engaging with governments to take that on, that treatment capacity on as a, as a standard basic health service. The foundation for longer term service is present. We have made major achievements as a community in t integrating SAM treatment into policies and guidelines. And did that just flip over? Sorry. Okay, but at the same time, key bottlenecks remain in terms of the application around actual costed action plans and funds for implementation, around national curriculum that integrates SAM treatment into national capacity, and uh, a number of different issues around supplies and, and, and engagement at community level. We do know, and what is hopeful, is that it is possible to scale up in a short period of time, either across the number of countries or in response to large-scale emergencies. But still, as we look around, no matter how much we scale up, the issue of severe acute malnutrition remains. It, it remains a reality for far too many children, for far too many individuals. And that brings us back to the reality of the 2007 statement, prevention first, but treatment is essential for those that are malnourished. In relation to the mapping, which I started off with, I think that we we can highlight that the process of mapping and, and reflection has been important in and of itself and has guided UNICEF's inputs and, and investments in, in HMI, integrating SAM treatment into HMIS and regular reporting and uh, complementing the efforts of each of you and your agencies and organizations and capacities 
in terms of harnessing your own evaluations and, and, and knowledge and learning around SAM treatment. I think that maybe, the, certainly, I, I want to present with a number of caveats that I won't get into here, that one of the things that we did in the last round was partner with the CMN and with ACF to try to pull together for the first time a review of the availability and quality of coverage data, to be able to assemble a few of the issues around the table so that we can take them forward as a community. If we can say, on average, all caveats included, globally our geographic coverage in terms of the number of facilities that can provide SAM treatment services is only 43%. And that globally our treatment coverage, the number of individuals who need treatment, who are treated, is around seven, estimates are around 7 to 13%. Caveats aside, at the bottom line is, it's too low. And how does that relate to our actual burden? This is uh, the 2000 and the latest global burden estimates, again with caveats, um, where we know that right now approximately 8% of children are estimated to have severe acute malnutrition, leading to about 17.6 million. Where are they? We start off in Latin America, around the Europe, European regions, Middle East and North Africa all the way down to an amazing burden in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Where are our programs? They are primarily in the middle. Where are our programs? They are not primarily in development contexts, where the majority of the, of the global burden lies. So looking ahead, a few, a few nuggets to add to the discussion. We very much appreciate the discussion earlier about creating access, creating supply, creating demand. When we look forward to creating demand, we're currently, uh, uh, the co community-based cadres are an amazing, amazing tool, an amazing way of engaging and reaching communities at the farthest, farthest level. However, they're be in some contexts, they're becoming overburdened, a number of different, ish a number of different activities, expectations put on them, and in many times, unpaid. We need to perhaps think outside of the box and harness our respective models of what works around engaging and supporting community outreach and taking that forward. And that perhaps we need to also engage more heavily in creating that constituency that demands at community level this type of, of, of support and engagement and enabling themselves, to, and, and enabling empowerment to be able to, to address their needs within their communities themselves. Areas for action, I will be very clear that we can, as, as the UN, acknowledge that we have a ways to go in collaboration between UN sister agencies to ensure a continuum of care. When we have one UN agency responsible for inpatient, and we have one UN agency responsible for this, and we have one UN agency responsible for that, it creates a system that's difficult for governments and partners to engage. We have a ways to go, and we have been taking some steps in the last year, and I look forward to hopefully telling you next year what we've been able to do together. There are platforms that we have to build off in terms of uh, facility level. We have district health service strengthening. We have ICCM. We have a WHO UNICEF task force on integration. We have a health system platform that we can engage with and we can engage with more strongly, but may also need us to bring in more of our health colleagues. Policies are a critical first step, but we need to take it forward in terms of moving this into action and, and engaging at country level with costed nutrition action plans and engaging with the governments to move away, and donors to help support us, move away from a stop-start model of treatment of severe acute malnutrition. To ensure scalable capacity, which in involves investing in local capacity. Around quality of services, as much as information guides us, it's the supervision and the management that, that improves quality on the ground. We have a critical role as we move ahead in improving our nutrition information systems to also invest in our su in support and capacity to supervise and manage programs at a very decentralized level. And as well, we're dealing with the same child. We're dealing with the same child that may have multiple deprivations, as the same child that may need support, whose mother might need support around infant and young child feeding practices. In high, burden, in a high HIV burden areas, they may also need services for that. We ha are dealing with the same child when we talk about quality of services, maybe we also need to think more strongly about how we integrate across. I know I'm stealing. Saul was very nice. Example of partnership, he lent me a few minutes. Um, 
And then I think to build off of, <laughs> of Steve's last point is that around the, the supply issue, one, while we may have moved forward and made progress in, in engaging governments with their capacity to identify and treat individuals, perhaps it's, there's been a bit of a lag in investing in government's capacity to manage supply chains and to, to manage local production and to manage, um, yes, without a similar capacity in handling commodities needed in the supply chain. I do have to say, I mean, I think we can acknowledge there is an increasing production capacity for RUTF. I think that UNICEF has a, as a very much a large procurer has a specific role to play. I acknowledge that progress has been made, but we can go further. I think there, there are certainly issues that we can, we can bring to bear. I think a few things just to raise, highlight a few challenges is that product specifications to date have often are non-existent. We're conceived without consultation necessarily with food technologists. No, what? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> and food purchasers. And I think that there are a number of, this raises a number of complications for actually the import product registration and production. I think there is hope, there is a lot of exciting research and that we need to continue to move forward to expand that toolbox in terms of local supplies, options and engaging in government capacity to manage that and as well not leaving aside the very important role of uh, ensuring that routine medications are available as well. For nutrition information, I think the the highlight points are that we need to continue to invest in our nutrition information, addressing methodology issues, addressing uh, better use of an analysis of data, and also, at the end of the day, building off of existing systems, bringing in additional components, strengthening what's there so that we can um, effectively know where we are and where we're going and monitor what needs to monitor and identify what needs to be done. In terms of the global SAM mapping, one particular area is reviewing and consolidating a bit around our, our geographic coverage, how we define that. And then improving treatment coverage methods, which I will leave to you to discuss. And then, I guess, in summary, coming back, I, I think it, it touches back on the advocacy issue. Addressing severe acute malnutrition is not an either or. We are addressing multiple forms of undernutrition in the same communities, in the same child. We have a number, a lot of, we have increasing evidence about the number of, ca number of bouts of wasting contributing to stunting. I think it's not an either or. How do we move that forward? It means working and collaborating more closely within the nutrition network to ensure that we are integrating across nutrition specific. It's integrating more and engaging, in, uh, articulating our engagement with nutrition sensitive and improving the conditions in which indivi individuals live. And I think bringing it back, many of the issues that we've raised around SAM and institutionalization and integration are the same for many other nutrition interventions. So I think that it just brings us back prevention first and all that that entails, but treatment is urgently needed for those who are malnourished.